Well, good morning, church. We are currently outside in a wonderful, fresh, noisy, outdoors, outdoorsy goodness. Um, I was feeling a little cooped up. I think maybe some of you guys have been feeling a little cooped up. So I thought some, you can hear the birds chirping. Someone's mowing their lawn already in the distance. That's great. Thought you guys could use some fresh air, some fresh sun, some fresh something or other. But here's some fresh worship, and it's just great to be with you guys today. We're going to have some fun.
Hello, Redeemer. It is mind-boggling to think that it has almost been two months since we at last experienced in-person church together. And while I'm deeply grateful for all of the technological ways that we can stay connected, I miss you. I miss seeing you face to face. Last week, Pastor Terry reflected on love, and she used verses from 1 Corinthians 13, very familiar verses to all of us. And right in the middle of that chapter on love, the Apostle Paul writes something that speaks speaks directly to our experience today. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror, maybe a digital signal. Then Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So even now, when we can't be together yet, we are still the church. And for that, I am grateful. Gratefulness is our best weapon against fear and anxiety. And while I'm, and what I'm grateful most for today is you, your care, your compassion, your generosity. And as a reminder, you can continue to give online at redeemermn.org forward slash give, or by mailing your offering to the church office. Again, thank you, Redeemer. A couple of things that are going on in the life of Redeemer. Prayer is something that connects us to God and prayer unites followers of Jesus. So I want to invite you into prayer point. Stay united through prayer. Look for prayer point daily on Facebook, Instagram, and the Redeemer website. Also coming up this summer, we have Women's Redeemer Bible Study. Um, The Women of Redeemer registered today for that summer Bible study. It's starting May 18th, Finding God Faithful with teacher Kelly Minter. And to find that information and to register, you can go to the Redeemer MN website for all those details. Last but not least, we are still continuing with conversations on Zoom. Connect to community through this thing called Conversations on Zoom. Immediately after the premiere of this service at 11.30 a.m., on this Sunday or 6.30 p.m. on Monday evenings. It is as simple as downloading the Zoom app to your computer, phone, or tablet, clicking join, or entering in the meeting ID on your screen just by clicking the Zoom link in the chat. Ask questions, discuss the message, join us for conversations on Zoom. I'm particularly excited about this sermon series that we have beginning today, Anxious for Nothing. And before it begins, I want to pray for us, for all of us as a community. Lord, we thank you that we can encounter you in a very powerful way, even online. We want to pray for our community, that as we face these times that nobody has faced before, that we would recognize you, that we would see you at work in our lives, and that we would engage with what it means to be anxious for nothing. We pray over this message. We pray over Pastor John. We ask that you would use him to raise up people who believe first in you and trust you first. And we pray that we would learn what it means to be anxious for nothing. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's saints said together, amen. Good morning, church. It is so great to be with you today. Today, we're going to start a new series called Anxious for Nothing. When Paul writes his letter to the Philippian church, he says that we're to be anxious for nothing, which is mind boggling because Paul wrote this letter while in prison and in chains. He had a lot to be anxious about and he wasn't. With all that's going on in our world today, we have a lot to be anxious about as well. So in this series, we wanna look at how, regardless of what we're facing, how we too can be anxious for nothing. We tend to use the words anxious and worried interchangeably. And that's okay, but they are different. At its simplest level, worry is more focused on what you're thinking and angst or anxiety is more focused on what you're feeling. Being anxious often starts with worry. Um, and so that's where we're going to start our series today is talking about worry. Now, we're all different. We all experience worry at different levels. Some of you are so chill, you don't worry about anything. We might need to take your blood pressure just to make sure you're still with us. 
Others in your life might get frustrated at you because you don't worry enough. At the other end of the spectrum, you have those professional worriers. You internalize everyone's problems. You carry around the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're so good at it, you might think worry is your spiritual gift, <laughs> but it's not. You worry about everything, but it drives you crazy. You've tried to worry less, but trying harder to worry less is like trying harder to go to sleep at night. The harder you try, the less you actually sleep. And the rest of us, when it comes to worry, are somewhere in the middle. In light of this pandemic, some of you who did not consider yourself to be much of a worrier are beginning to worry. And so with all that's going on, I thought this would be a timely topic for us for the next few weeks. I want to begin by asking three questions. These questions are, are meant to reveal what's behind your worry. And if you answer them honestly, we pretty much could end the message right here. <laughs> the first question is this. I didn't make this one up. You may have heard it before. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? <laughs> Somebody very smart asked that question. <laughs> we'll get to Jesus' words in just a few moments when we dig into the scripture for today. Second question. Who of you have worried so much that you may think you have shortened your life expectancy? And then the third question, it's a bit more complicated. It's a two-parter, but it sets us up for where we are going. Is there anything more valuable to you than staying alive? And if there is, will worry and enhance that thing that you value more than life? Now, the answer is probably no. So in summary, if worry doesn't extend your life, if worrying has the potential, like many experts agree, to shorten your life, and if worrying doesn't enhance or make your life better, why worry? I mean, logically, it doesn't make any sense. If worry is a waste of time and time equals life, then worry is a waste of life, right? Logically, that makes sense. So as your pastor, I want to just tell you today, stop it. All right, let's end in prayer. No, it wouldn't be great if it was that simple. It's not. Wouldn't it be great if just answering those three questions alleviated all of your worries? But it's not that simple. So for the next few weeks, we're going to look at what Jesus had to say about worry in Matthew 6. I'm going to break it into two parts because I don't want to rush through his incredible insights. And honestly, my hope in this series is that if you can embrace Jesus' way of thinking, if you can incorporate that into your life, it will reduce your worry significantly. In Matthew what Jesus said about worry is so amazing that most of our modern day authors and psychologists, they borrowed from his ideas. He defines the problem so clearly and so easily we can discover for ourselves what he meant. In summary, here's what Jesus said. He said, the things that you are most devoted to are the things that you worry about the most. Jesus is saying, let me take the mystery out of worry for you. If you wanna know what drives your worry, what do you place your greatest devotion in? Let me illustrate it to you this way. I'll be transparent. A little time for, um, uh, how would I say it? Uh, true confession. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't worry about your job. I don't stay awake at night worrying about your job because I'm not devoted to your job. Now, don't get me wrong. If you were to call me or text me and say, Pastor John, I've lost my job. I would, my heart would be filled with compassion I would be concerned, I would be worried, I would do whatever I could, I would pray with you. But to be real, I don't worry about your job because I'm not devoted to it. Another confession, I don't worry about your kids' grades, ever. Do I care? Of course I care. If you were to say, John, my child is so struggling in 10th grade, I don't know if he's gonna make it through. I would be concerned, I would try to help, I would pray, I would do whatever I could, but I don't stay awake at night worrying about your kids' grades. Thirdly, I don't worry about your retirement. I mean, I hope it's great. I hope you're able to do all the things that you want to do, but I don't worry about your retirement because I'm not devoted to it. I'm not devoted to making sure that you are able to retire in a financially secure way. That's not my devotion. You see, worry is tied to the things that I am most devoted to. My kids, <laughs> my work, my money. And Jesus says, the things that you worry about reflect your core devotions. And in this passage, 
Jesus is going to make a, a, an amazing question that he wants to shift your thinking on. He says, what if you shifted your devotion? What would happen to your worry? That's an amazing thought. I mean, Jesus is brilliant. The Bible's awesome. That's where he's going to take us these next two weeks. So let's jump into what Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, verse 24. Now, when Jesus launches a conversation about worry, guess which topic he uses to launch it? Money. Yeah. I love how relevant the Bible is today. To, to today. The polls say that Americans' number one worry is about money, about you know, their personal finances and the economy. The Bible is so relevant. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says these words. Now, or sorry, not now, but no one can serve two masters. Either, he will, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted. There's that word. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, when Jesus uses that word money, it's a Greek word mammon, which literally means stuff. So Jesus is saying, you can't serve God and you can't serve your stuff. You can't be fully devoted to both. They're at war against each other. You've got to decide which one you're most devoted to. And you might say, Pastor John, I love God and I love my stuff. But Jesus says, you can't do both. Because when push comes to shove, one is going to take a back seat. That's, that's kind of intense, I know. He's saying, you've got to decide which one that is. And then Jesus, in his wonderful way, he goes deeper. In verse 25, he says, therefore. And whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore? Because Jesus is connecting two thoughts. He said, so, and he's saying, there's a war going on of who you're going to sue, who's going to be the boss in your life. And in verse 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Now that's pretty general. So he gets more specific about the things that his audience in his day would be concerned about, that they'd be worried about. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Those were major concerns to his audience. If he were addressing us today, he would say this, Look, don't worry about if you're going to be able to retire. Don't worry about whether your kids are going to get into the perfect school for them. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to be single the rest of your life. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to find that job that you love or in this economy be able to keep that job that you love. Don't worry about your health. In general, he says, don't worry about your life. Now, that's Jesus' words, not me, so email him. He said, now, is Jesus saying that those things are unimportant? No. He's saying the opposite. He's saying they are important, but you don't need to worry about them. He's saying there's a, ways to, there's a way to face the uncertainty of tomorrow and not worry about it today. And then in verse 25, he asks this very important question. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Here's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to pull us out of our, our hyper-focus that we get into and we get all worried, where we say, oh my gosh, I've got to get into that college. Or, oh my gosh, I, I've got to get my health back so I can go play golf again. Or, oh my gosh, and, and we begin to get all hyper-focused. And when we do that, we worry. And he wants to pull us back and say, is life not more important than the school you attend? It is. Does life equal health or is there more to life than just your health? There is. Is life more important than just being married? Yes, it is. And so Jesus wants to pull us back and change our perspective. And then he drills deeper in verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns. He's saying to us, birds don't have a 401k. <laughs> they don't go to college. They don't walk their kids around holding their hand constantly with a helmet on just so that they don't get hurt. I mean, when you think about it, birds do the opposite. They build their nests high in the air, and at a certain time, they just shove them out and say, good luck. <laughs> think about that for a parenting strategy. <laughs> they don't sow. They don't reap. They're flying around, and suddenly a couple of them decide they're flying south, and the rest are like, oh, okay, I guess I'll fly south with them. They don't think about those things. And yet God takes care of them. And you have to be careful not to misread that verse because Jesus is not making fun of your hard work. Because in the end of verse 26, he says this, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. He cares for them. And then he asks another question. Are you not much more valuable than they? 
Let me ask it in a different way. Do you think God cares about you more than he cares about the birds? Well, of course the answer is yes. But let, let me remind you, you were created in God's image. I mean, when you read the creation, the story of creation, God creates all this amazing stuff. But then when it comes to you and me, he says, I'm going to create humankind in my image. They're going to bear my thumbprint. When I see them, I'm going to see a reflection of me. And when they see me, I want them to know how much I love them. In fact, I will send a savior in the world to save them. But I'm not going to send the savior in the form of a bird or a flower or a cow or even a lion. I'm going to send my son in the form of a human being. So God is saying, before you jump on the, oh my gosh, what's going to happen tomorrow train? He's saying, do you think God cares about you more than he does the birds? And the answer is, of course, yes. And I understand that this isn't deep, but it's a huge statement of faith. Jesus says, this is a bit elementary, but I want to teach you how you can have uncertainty about tomorrow and not worry about it today. His point isn't be, be irresponsible because it'll all work out. That's fatalism. He's inviting us to trust in him as a heavenly father. He's saying, look, I want you to sow. I want you to reap. I want you to stow away in barns. I want you to fill out applications. I want you to knock on doors and study hard and go on dates. I want you to set goals and do your best. But after you've done all that you can do, I want you to remember that I love you more than the birds and I'm going to take care of you. You don't need to worry now about the next now. And then in this context, Jesus asked that first question that I began this message with. Verse 27, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Well, the answer is no. So Jesus is saying, when you begin to worry, think about this revolutionary thought. If God loves me more than he loves the birds and he takes care of them, can I trust him? even with the things I can't control? And the answer is yes, so why worry? And then Jesus reiterates that point by saying these words in verses 28 to 30. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you. And then he connects the dots. In verse 30, listen to how he closes it. He says, you of little faith. Yes, our emotions get attached to things that we're most devoted to, but at the core, worry is a faith issue. Are you trusting God with the uncertainty of tomorrow? And if you're like me, this is where we oftentimes get stuck. We think, well, I know God can, but I don't know if God will. <laughs> I know God can take care of me. I know God can help me get into the best school. I know God can help me meet the right person. I know God can ensure my future. I know he can, but I don't know if he will. And Jesus says, okay, that's where it takes trust. That's where it takes faith. Where is your confidence? Let me ask you an important question. What if you could wake up every day and live your life absolutely confident that God was your heavenly father and that he could be trusted? You could stop worrying because of your trust in your heavenly father. Not because you can predict the future or bring certainty into that future. At church, <laughs> dear brothers and sisters, I have a news flash for you. Not one single second of your life has ever been a certainty. <laughs> we have lived with uncertainty since the day we were born. It's just that at different stages of life, we become more aware of those uncertainties. But here's the new flash. Your future has been uncertain every single day that you've been alive. And I know that when we face a thing like this global virus, we become more aware of our uncertainty. And Jesus is saying, God has been faithful to you in your past uncertainty. You might not have been aware of, uh, as aware about it or stressed out about it, but folks, he's aware of the uncertainty and he's taking care of you in the past and he'll take care of you in the future. 
With this global pandemic, our life has changed. Our culture has changed. Our economy has changed. But what about God has changed? Absolutely nothing. So we're going to stop here this week. We're going to pick up again next week. Let me just kind of close by reminding you where we've been. The first thing I said is that worry is a waste of time and time equals life. And so worry is a waste of life. So when your brain starts to get attached to something that you have no control over, ask yourself, is this worth worrying or is this worth wasting my life to worry about this? Is it? The second thing we learned is that we're to do what we can do. We're to sow, we're to reap, we're to store. All those things. But then we're to trust God with the things that we can't do. Just like he takes care of the birds, just like he closed the flowers, he's going to take care of you. And then the third thing we talked about, and this is the deeper one, if our emotion is driven by the things that we're most devoted to, my question I'd like you to ask this week is this. What are you most devoted to? When you look at your life and what you worry about the most, that's what you're most devoted to. And Jesus starts this conversation by saying, you can't be devoted to both God and to your stuff. And if you spend most of your time worried about your stuff, that's what you're most devoted to. So my encouragement to you this week, my challenge to you, is I want you to, each day this week, take a few minutes, read and reread Matthew 6, 24, verse 34. 10 verses, Matthew 6, 24 to 34. Let Jesus' words change you. Because if you'll take that time and read, what's going to happen is, is some of those words are going to jump off that page. The Holy Spirit's going to just bring that fresh to your mind, and he's going to be doing something in your heart around this issue of worry. And then next week we'll jump in, and we'll finish up the second part about how Jesus wants us to overcome worry. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful that your word is so clear, that your wisdom is so amazing. <laughs> Lord, thank you for reminding us that, you know, what we're devoted to is what we worry about. And so, Lord, help us to look at what we worry about and replace our devotion. Because when our devotion is on you, when our trust is in you, who takes care of everything, it will reduce our worry and our anxiety. And so, Lord, for those today that are struggling, those that are feeling like, ooh, that kind of hits home, that hit me between the eyes, the, the Holy Spirit speaking to me. God, I pray your grace and your wisdom to be with them. I pray, Lord, that they could begin to maybe look at the tomorrow differently. Because tomorrow is as uncertain as it has ever been. And yet, God, you have taken care of us each and every day to today. And so, Lord, help us to trust you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. We'll see you next week.
to God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after Of the goodness of God.